we just faced an emergency some years before, right? Uh, there was an emergency alarm, and look how we all orderly um, moved away from, uh, in orderly fashion, from the room. How come? How come did we do that? Anyone has an idea? How come did, did we all, in a way, moved in a very orderly manner outside, outside this uh, theater hall and outside the, the screen? Oh. There should be panic, right? If it was a real emergency, so we knew it wasn't really an emergency. But there was a norm out there, right? There was something that was telling us that we should have stood up and moved in an orderly fashion and moved away from the, from the theater, uh, from, the, from this room. Okay, so no ambivalence there. The norm was clear. While the law of climate change or the, the way in which law rate to climate change is ambivalent. And I want to give some examples here, we just, just a couple to be very quick. Um, so there is a, a field of international law and, on climate change decided here, right? The COP, this conference of the parties, the Paris Agreement, uh, states getting together, agreeing on finding ways to tackle climate change. Um, but the Paris Agreement uh, is struggling, there is struggle in the Paris Agreement in the process of the COP to implement yeah, what states are promising to do uh, in the future about climate change, and not just now. And also the promises that the states are making uh, they are not matching at all what we would require to be in this 1.5 degrees Celsius pathway of emission reductions. So, and you would expect that in a treaty, in a system of law, there should be a control. There should be a form of enforcement of the law. So if a state does not comply with, with that system, then there should be uh, consequences. Well, the Paris Agreement does not have that. So you have here a system that tries to get to get the states to cooperate, but with no teeth. Mm? So it is not really effective, and it creates a struggle, and it's part of one of the values of the law in relationship to climate change. Let me take you then to another side of international law. So we can call it a bit the international law of the oil machine. Mm? So international investment law. There is a law, well, there, is, there are loads of treaties in international law that protect foreign investors from the actions that state hosting the investment can do to the investment. So think about the transition of moving away from the fossil fuel, uh, from the oil machine. Well, this system works really well, is extremely effective, why? Because the rules are, let's say, clearer and there are also possibilities for the foreign investors and in some cases fossil fuel companies to do what? Well, to threaten and use the teeth of the law of enforcement through the work of international investment tribunals. Tribunals that decide as to whether the state has breached certain rules in, let's say, uh, blocking a permit or trying to detransition yeah, from from fossil fuel exploration. And this is something that is happening here in the Netherlands. So uh, RWE, a, a German uh, fossil fuel producer, has been, uh, well, has sued uh, the government of Netherlands under one of these treaties uh, because the government of the Netherlands is trying to uh, implement a policy for phasing out coal production yeah, uh, by 2030. And this is, of course, impacting the legitimate economy, economic expectations of RWE. And RWE has this, that means to enforce its interest under international law. So here there is ambivalence. Yeah? And, and there is a struggle to make international climate change law effective on one side, while on the other side, uh, there, there is already a well-oiled uh, part of international law that is quite effective. So uh, maybe uh, I, I would like to conclude here, yeah, with just leaving uh, this, these two impressions uh, and these two themes that uh, uh, raised in me uh, uh, by looking at this documentary with the lenses of 
international law and of climate change. And, and with that, Amma, I, I, uh, well, I would like to ask you what, what, do you, what do you think about that? So do you see also this ambivalence and struggle or how has that emerged um, maybe during the production of this documentary or maybe in some parts of the documentary that... Uh, Gosh, it, it's, a, it's so interesting to hear you speak because I'm thinking that ambivalence manifests itself probably in all of our lives even though we don't want to see it but more important probably in terms of this film and in terms of what we're looking at is the structures that actually mean that we kind of have lost our democratic ability to determine our future in terms of fossil fuels and um, carbon emissions um, from them, which is slightly terrifying. And I think, I think that for me is really the question is, what are the limits of our democracy just now? And in order to understand those limits, I think we really need to understand what really happens in terms of this kind of legality that you're describing that favours um, corporations. Um, however, <laughs> I know that in the Netherlands especially, there's um, a current case against Shell by Roger Cox, I think. I think that's his name. And I know that the, that, that has been successful, although I think there's, a, there's, a, there's a, an appeal from Shell. Is that right? Yes, exactly. So there's, uh, these movements are happening all over the world. And obviously also in, in the film, we have... Um, the movement that Michaela Loach, the young activist who was a medical student, did against the, the, the Campbell oil field, which actually um, wasn't successful, but in a way, for her, that didn't matter. The main thing was that it made the public aware of what was happening. So I think this question of how every part of our systems that have been put in place um, can be questioned and can be interrogated by us as citizens is so important and why your, your expertise, David, is, is, really, is really needed so much here. Um, so I think we have a lot to learn in terms of how we, um, how we ensure that actually the treaties which are signed about um, not exceeding 1.5, which we already know, is a dream of the past, unfortunately, and really are enforceable. And how are they enforceable? And I think, unfortunately, just looking at all companies isn't going to get there. I think the finance market, for me, is really the clue. Um, but I'm sure many people here have their own ideas, but it seems like that really is where, is where action can be taken and where things can change. But that also needs some kind of regulation.